back in. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, we're gonna get started. Um, we're running a few minutes late. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so thank you for joining us for this presentation of the embodiment in the counseling classroom uh, presented to us by Amanda and Mary Ellen from Belmont University. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to them. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat as we go. I will, if Amanda and Mary Ellen do not see them, I will just let them know that they're there and uh, we will go from there and I'll hand it over to you guys. Right, good morning. Greetings from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, we're happy to have you here today. Um, we're just gonna introduce ourselves and then get into the content. So I'm Mary Ellen. And I am currently in Belmont's master's program of mental health counseling. And just a little bit about myself for the past seven years, I've served as a holistic nutritionist at a wellness rehab center here in Nashville. And through my work with nutrition and women, I just realized there was a deeper component of the psychological that I really wanted to understand. And so that is what led me here. And moving forward, I'm hoping to kind of combine um, things that I have learned and put them together and help people come into more congruency in their mind, in their body, and their spirit. And she starts practicum in a week. Like a week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I am Amanda Graney Bradbury, and I'm a professor at Belmont. Uh, mental health in Belmont's mental health counseling program. And I've been practicing as a licensed marriage and family therapist since 2004 and teaching in higher ed since 2010. So um, when I saw the call for proposals for this conference, I was like, oh, what would be fun to present on with a student? And I immediately thought of Mary Ellen in this topic and thought it would be neat to combine our different perspectives, the professor perspective, the student perspective um, of embodiment. So that's what we'll be talking about today. And again, as Kat mentioned, if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat or just turn on your uh, screen and wave your hand at us. We have your little squares up so we can see you. So um, to get us started this morning or afternoon, depending where you are, um, we're just going to do a brief opening practice as a means to invite you into what embodiment could potentially look like in a more academic setting. So um, take a minute and just notice your body in your current surroundings. So the invitation here is to notice any areas of tension. The check-in start at the top of your head. Slowly move your attention into you, down throughout your body, over your shoulders, through your torso, into the mid space of your body, down your legs and ending down at your feet. So as you're checking in with your body, not only are we asking you to check in, we're having a hard time hearing you. Oh, okay, thank you for letting me know. Is that any better? That's much better. Okay, um, just, I'll adjust my volume. Um, so, also paying attention to areas of ease or openness. And then taking a minute just to notice your body in your surroundings. Is there anything you could do to feel more comfortable, more alert and present? I know that attending an online conference is just a space that can be really distracting with lots of tabs open or people in and out of your own space. 
So taking a minute to make yourself as comfortable while also as honoring to you in this time. And that will conclude our opening practice. And we're gonna move into some content now, potentially. All right, and go over some definitions of embodiment. Yeah, so I'm gonna read a few definitions to kind of get you familiar with the term embodiment. Is there one more before this slide? I moved it. Okay. Sorry. All right. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so the first one is embodiment is described as a verb like noun reflecting an abstract idea, proves, and is adamant about viewing the body as actively engaged. Embodiment can therefore be thought of as a multi level phenomenon, as it necessarily entails the interplay between bodies components of bodies and the worlds in which the body lives. Another one is embodiment is a coming home, a remembering of our wholeness and a reunion with the fullness of ourselves. Being in our body gives us access to all the wisdom that our bodies hold. This allows us to know ourselves more fully, experiencing ourselves as good and sacred, and hold safety within ourselves no matter what happens around us. Yeah, so these academic definitions speak to this sort of what we would think of as the more lived experiences that we have with our bodies. Um, do we want to check in about how we, what we think about these definitions? Yeah. Um, so I, as I hear, heard Mary Ellen read through these definitions, uh, the word that really stuck out to me was that like wisdom, that our bodies hold so much wisdom that we have historically been taught to ignore. Um, I have little kids at home and I am aware of how often I want them to hold still, like if my daughter's four and I was putting her hair in a ponytail this morning and I just had, a, I was like, hold your body still please. <laughs> and thinking about kids being in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, how often we are told to ignore that wisdom that our bodies tell us that we need to move or um, we've been sitting still for too long. So this has been ingrained in us for a really long time. Yeah, and I would just add to that. So the word that kind of um, resonates with me with embodiment is a word I love and it's congruency. Mm -hmm. So just how Dr. Greenby Bradley was saying, like there's such a disconnect. I've noticed it in my nutrition work and then just in life in general, but a lot of people are very disengaged. Their mind and their body is very disengaged. And so embodiment is bringing those things together and just creating more congruency within yourself. Okay, so the next definition that we have is more related to this idea of teaching and academia. So this comes uh, as a quote from Becky Tom Thompson's book, uh, Teaching with Tenderness, and I highly recommend it to anyone who's an educator or who desires to be an educator. It Just her perspectives on teaching are so refreshing. Um, but I'll just read it for us. So teaching and learning start with the body, the happy body, the brown body, the young body, the worried body, the hurt body, the curious body, the growing body. The body is the starting place for intellectual, spiritual, and political growth. And if we think about learning from this perspective, it's really easy to identify some critique of the way that academia is now. Um, I keep getting different alerts. <laughs> Did you hear that? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So when we think about academia's relationship with the body, it really, um, there's not been a great relationship. We, as I mentioned, we can think about it starting with little kids and then moving on up to even, you know, adult higher education when we think about graduate programs. 
um, we tend to ignore those embodied experiences. Uh, for those of us who are in academia for a profession, there can be such an emphasis on writing and publishing as a means to get promotion. Um, also while teaching full-time and as a counselor educator, many of us are also counseling outside and supervising. So there's a such an emphasis on work, 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 and not as much of an emphasis on congruence or stress regulation. Um, we could even think about academia ignoring the soft sciences of counseling or not valuing emotional intelligence as much as we value uh, formal, rigorous research, not valuing qualitative research as much as we do quantitative research. Um, so there is an invitation here to think about ways to honor the body, honor our emotional experiences, our relational wellness, not just cognitive, intellectual experience, especially in counselor education. So one critique and one barrier that Mary Ellen and I have from a lived perspective is that our program has classes at night. And so two nights a week, we're there from 5.30 to 9.30. And you can imagine <laughs> um, some critiques that we may have of that. So, you know, as in, for me as the educator, I, it, I'm never sure when to eat because, you know, I don't normally eat prior to 5.30 at night. Um, standing up for four hours, working with students who many have worked all day long. I have often also worked all day long. That is not a very kind setup to our bodies. Many of us, I mean, some of us are in our early 20s, but many of us are not anymore. And we're tired. We, mm -hmm. Mary Ellen and I are both more morning people. Mm -hmm. And so staying up and not getting home till 10 is just a difficult journey for our bodies. Is there anything you want to add to that? I'll, I'll okay. add it later. Okay. okay. So agreed. <laughs> so you could also think about either if you're currently in a counselor education curriculum program, if you teach, or, or maybe it's been a while, you could think about your own, um, the structure of your own classes. When I was in grad school, my classes were from 8 to 2.45, and we met six weeks. It's a really long time to just sit, just sit and learn. So you know, this foundation of what can we do to invite the body into the learning experience? All right, so part of the wisdom here comes from the field of counseling that since I've been practicing, I have seen this shift of inviting the body into the counseling session. You know, we can have a deep appreciation for Dr. Bessel van der Kolk's work of The Body Keeps the Score. I remember when that book came out, it was so refreshing to just name that it's not weird to consider the body, <laughs> you know, that we walk around with all of this internal wisdom. And when we're working with folks who've experienced trauma or who have not experienced trauma, for any of us who have ever experienced depression, anxiety, uh, relational distress, attention challenges, all of those things are housed in our body. So, you know, we're paying attention to this a lot more. We are currently in my counseling office and in this space, I'm so often attuned to those different bodily shifts that happen in clients as we uncover different truths or explore different challenges. The other piece that we pay attention to and that I invite students to consider would be the body of the counselor. This can come down to as specific of making sure that you have a comfortable chair, making sure that you're well hydrated, that you're well fed, um, 
making sure that you are taking breaks between sessions, maybe going outside, stretching, going on a walk, whatever that may be, but also attending to our own bodies while we're doing the sacred work. Okay, so I feel like I'm talking a lot. Can we do your stance and then go back. back to my stance? Okay. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of walk you through, um, I'm gonna get personal and walk you through kind of my um, routine, if you will, or tools that I use to kind of help me get into an embodied learning space. So I'm gonna start even before I enter class. So um, some things that I do, um, it, the first thing I really do is kind of just take inventory of my body. And so this is just checking in with my physical needs. Um, questions I ask myself is like, okay, what's my energy like right now? Do I need to make like some green tea? Do I need a little bit of caffeine to like, you know, because Dr. Greeny Bradley told you guys our classes are at night. Um, I had been working all day. So like, what do I need to get my energy to a point that I can really focus? Um, so taking care of that. Um, and sometimes that's just by drinking water and hydrating myself. Um, making sure I have water with me um, or a beverage or something that will, um, yeah, just keep me hydrated. And then going into the nourishment part, and I'll, I'll speak more on into that on the next slide. But yeah, am I hungry before class? Do I need a snack? Um, because I know it'll be a little bit before I eat. So what do, what does my body need hunger wise? And then moving more into my mind, um, really trying to clear space and make room to receive the information and to truly learn. And so a lot of times this happens in the car for me as I'm driving to school, um, I've had a full day. And so I'm kind of going through my checklist and my to-do list and, and just making sure that um, things are done so I'm not bringing it into the classroom. And so, yeah, even before stepping into the classroom, I'm, I'm taking care of, you know, just things that I need to do at the house, um, my job responsibilities, and something that really helped me, I feel like, tremendously these last two semesters are having some strong boundaries with school and work. So when I'm at work, I'm going to fully be at work, 100%. And then when I'm at school, I'm solely at school. And so for me, that helped my mind stay clear in both situations because they're both very important in my life. And so directing my focus, you know, when I'm at work, I'm at work. And when I'm at school, I'm at school. So those are some things that kind of helps, yeah, create clarity in my mind. And then and I just want to highlight to you the beautiful intention that she's bringing to her learning experience hope that y'all can hear all of that and how that really sets her up for success as a learner and counselor. All right, and then moving into during class. So ways in which I want to bring embodiment into the classroom is number one, eye contact. Um, as we all know, it's a very powerful nonverbal. And for me, not only does it communicate respect to the professor, but also it keeps my mind engaged. And when my mind is engaged, it's really hard for other thoughts to come in and distract me. And so that's just one way I really try to keep focus is, is really try to keep that eye contact. Another way is with an open posture. So making sure that I'm coming in relaxed. Um, so sometimes, on my way to school, I'll like turn on music that I enjoy um, just to get my body kind of release my day. I'm releasing my to-do list. I'm getting more relaxed, listening to the music that I like, um, making sure I'm grounded so that I'm breathing. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes as we all know, days get busy and you go from one thing to the next and the breath gets really shallow. And so opening up the breath and just really breathing and, and grounding myself. Um, and then also coming in just with a warmth, with an openness um, to definitely the professor, but then to also my classmates, because I feel like for me, 
Um, learning just takes on another level when you're doing it with people and when you can collaborate and bounce ideas off one another. And so for me, that really, that, that naturally happens with an open posture. It, it's hard to create that dialogue and that collaboration when someone's closed off. And so making sure that um, not only my posture is open, but to my brain, my heart, my spirit's just open. Um, and then the next one, I'm gonna speak to nutrition because it is a high value of mine um, because when I am hungry, I cannot focus. That's like the only thing that I can focus on. And so um, due to the hours of our classes, it's right in the dinner hour. And so I always pack dinner because I know a snack won't just hold me over. Like I need substance. And I realized too, that substance, then, you know, I'm getting my nourishment, I'm getting vitamins, I'm getting minerals. And that also just enhances, gives me that energy boost so I can maintain that focus and that clarity um, for the extended amount of time that we're in class. And then the last thing I'm gonna to talk to you is movement. Um, I'm so thankful that we have breaks because I have a hard time sitting still for a, a long period of time. And so every 50 minutes or so um, we do get breaks. And so I'm definitely getting up during that time and moving my body, whether that's just taking some laps around the floor that we're on or going outside if I have time and breathing some fresh air. And also I feel like that just gives my mind a break because class is so um, rigorous and intense. And so having that break, is just kind of like a mental, like let's clear it. Um, but then also sometimes this happens to me, like a, a piece of information during class will stick with me and I'll, I'll like need to process it. And movement helps me do that, kind of that right, left brain thing kind of helps me process that. And then going back into class and, and getting more um, just feedback or information on, on what that thing was. Um, and then moving into transition to clinical work. So I truly believe what's practiced in the classroom is going to transfer into the counseling session. And so I feel like embodied, an embodied learner is going to be an embodied counselor. And so to me, that feels like a critical skill for the therapeutic relationship. When a client feels like you're truly attuned to them, not just with your ears, but with your entire body, um, I feel and I know from experience that that's going to create a really strong therapeutic relationship, which research shows that that is going to create successful treatment. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so before I get into to some of the things that I do, I just wanna check in and see if anyone has any questions or thoughts at this point. We'd love to hear your perspective or responses to Mary Ellen's strategies. Anyone? I can start us off. Um, I was thinking while, oh, sorry, animal feeding alarms going off. Uh, <laughs> um, I was thinking while uh, Mary Ellen, you were talking is I do all online schooling. Wow. And I have two children and my partner and everybody here plus animals and, uh, like how how do you do that like how would you even go about the embodiment like making a time making a space because i don't have a designated time for my class it's all online wow. so how would you go about for that like what do you guys recommend as far as like student goes like being a student in a mental health counseling program online mm -hmm. So I know for myself, and I think it's going to vary person to person, but I'm very um, rhythmic and a schedule does me really well. And so if I put myself in your shoes, I would just create some really strong boundaries um, for myself. And like when I did school, 
um, and kind of catering that around, like you mentioned, you have, you know, a partner and children and all the different components that fall into that and making sure that I'm doing class in a time that they're well taken care of um, and just really protecting that space so you can be fully focused and um, embodied in that in that learning space. Yeah, I love that. And it the intentionality um, of what you're doing. I, we saw this when a lot of people had to pivot and provide telehealth during the pandemic that people were feeling like, okay, I'm used to having my counseling office, which is my space where I don't hear children or my dog is not there with me or cat or whatever. And now I'm trying to figure out how to do this. And so even if you had the same chair that you always sat in, cat, or like you knew, you said to your partner, hey, I need 30 minutes to do this module. So pretend like I'm actually on campus, you know, like little things like that, like a, I love you, don't bother me <laughs> type of thing might actually be really helpful for you. Um, and also, you know, paying attention to surroundings of sometimes I think that like can be so soothing and then sometimes they're distracting. So having a comfort level with kicking them out, if you can, if that's the ability that you have. Yeah, yeah. But there are unique needs to being an online learner. Like there's, I think there are so many gifts in it and sometimes we can be too flexible with it. You know, I, as an educator, I've had students in class. I do, when I teach, if it's synchronous, I ask cameras to be on because it's really hard to look at boxes, you know, and not know who's there. And so asking people, you know, is laying in your bed really the best way to be to be processing this material because if I'm in my bed I'm getting very tired so just bringing some self-awareness to what you're doing excellent mm -hmm. I love that thank you guys so much I appreciate that any other thoughts or questions at this point oh uh Cody says excellent approach to class and client work yes thank you Cody mm -hmm. Okay, well, I will go back and talk some about the perspective that I try to integrate. And I want to name that, you know, if you do any research or you try to this, there's often this blanket awareness that this approach comes with risk. So as an educator, if you are embodied, you are vulnerable. So you are vulnerable to negative feedback. You are vulnerable to learners who are just maybe don't align with this approach or who um, could be intimidated by the approach. And anytime we open our hearts, we have to be aware of that risk and we need to follow up then with good self-care. And self-care is something that I feel like you all probably get tired of us talking about, but it's so central to what we do, both as students and as educators, and then also just as humans who are counselors all at the same time. Um, so a, a stance that I try to, you know, I, I do just want to share that, as I mentioned, I first started a faculty position in 2010. So over the past 13 years, I have noticed my stance changing. And, you know, there are some inherent challenges in being a therapist and also an educator. Um, I used to work in the undergrad sphere and I had some colleagues who taught in the STEM field. And I would always tell them that I was just so jealous that they didn't read the room in the way that I would, <laughs> because that just wasn't as important to them as it is to me. 
So anyone in this virtual room who is a counselor or a counselor in training, you know that our superpower is attunement that we are really good at reading people. And when we are reading people, we know then that they're bored <laughs> or that they're not paying attention or they don't care, or maybe it has nothing to do with me. It could have mm -hmm. to do with a text message they just got or a phone call they had on break or whatever, personal challenges, et cetera. But this professor stance of attunement sends the message, hopefully, in this space, in this space of classroom where, yes, I have power because I assign a grade. I decide when class starts. I decide when it ends. I give the breaks. I, you know, professors have a lot of power. We need to name that. But can I hold this power in one hand or maybe not even prominently? <laughs> and also hold space for tenderness and openness and curiosity and using my attunement skills as a means to foster an open classroom. Um, I really try to embody tender, I, I keep coming back to these words, but tenderness and curiosity and care. That is, as an educator, I have a sign in my room by an artist that I love, and it just says, teach love. And as a counselor educator, that is my simple mantra that I long for students to know safety and love, and that starts with me and my stance. Um, so I'll look at my notes and we start with that. Um, so from a course design perspective, and this may not be what you initially think of when you think of embodiment, but part of embodiment is a holistic approach to learning. So one thing that is a theme in my classes, no matter what the content of the class is, is that students and counselors in training will learn about themselves. They have to apply theories to themselves. So when we think about lifespan development or even just foundations of clinical practice, students are required to think about family of origin issues, maybe what has led them to becoming a counselor in the first place. So there's a lot of reflecting and a lot of journaling that's going to be happening in the course. And that is embedded into assignments and projects and things like that. Um, because, you know, we don't require our students to go to therapy themselves and many programs don't. There can be some informed consent consideration there. But we do know that people who do their own work can show up differently when they're sitting with clients. So this, that's kind of embedded in the, the design of the classes that I do. And then for the actual class sessions, um, you know, I have seen this significant impact of the pandemic. And I think that we will just continue to see it as the years go on. But there's a level of um, lower engagement. I think people, we have our outliers like Mary Ellen, <laughs> but then there's a lot of students who have just gotten really comfortable with hiding behind screens in the live setting. And that has become socially acceptable. There has been an increase in people wanting to just zoom into class rather than physically come to class. And there's an expectation in our program that you do physically come to class. And so that is a layer that I think embodiment can really help with. So when we think about um, our digital natives, so our future counselors who have always had a smartphone or who have never known dial-up internet or who have always had social media accounts, 
their brains are primed to be able to multitask in a way that my 43 year old brain does not know how to do. <laughs> so I personally, I a, if I'm talking to someone, I cannot text them, text at the same time. But like that multitasking is not a skill that I have, but I know many people who have that skill, right? And you may have that skill. You may have that I don't, skill. no, okay, I don't. We're a little slower uh, with technology. We were just talking about that earlier this morning. And that's fine. Both things are have their pluses and their minuses, right? But when we think about training to be a counselor, you are not texting while you're sitting with a client. At least I hope that you're not. You know, there's this attention that you have to bring to clients that is slow, it's measured, there's a lot of thought processes going on for you, and you can't hide behind the screen. So something that I do that I get dinged for in my course evaluations <laughs> is that I or whatever into class. So I do approach it slowly first semester. This, this year I tried first semester letting that happen, but I noticed incredible amounts of distraction. And you noticed it too, didn't yeah. you? What yeah. did you notice with yeah. the that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll say too, I'm, I've come back, I've been out of school for eight, nine years. So I'm coming back um, in my thirties and yeah, I just noticed there's such a um, difference in the ones that I guess have been in school during the pandemic and the screens are, yeah, it's, they're used to having them. And so I, I was like mesmerized by how they were getting this information, but then talking to their friends at the same time. And I'm like, how in the world are they doing that? And also too, this is like critical information that, that we need. And so definitely, yeah, realized the distraction piece of it. <clears throat> yeah. And there, so there's two key points here. One is that, yes, the, the information in class is very important, but we all know <laughs> that you're, we forget that information sometimes when we sit with clients. So, yes, the information is so important. But I think for me as an educator, what I am more concerned about is how are people going to be able to sit with clients? So, you know, maybe when you sit with a client, you don't need to have a smartwatch on. Or if you do have a smartwatch on, are your notifications turned off? Like, what does that practically look like? But also, what does it practically look like to be somewhere for 50 minutes without getting news alerts, without paying attention to a new email that comes through, without scrolling on Instagram while you're also listening to someone? So there's a brain training element that I'm considering when I'm thinking about class sessions. So one way that I try to foster presence is I have a bin that I bring to class. And in the bin, there's Play-Doh, there are different fidgets, there are coloring books. I did notice that color, I, I sound so rigid with this, but coloring books were even, <laughs> even became yeah. Some of a distraction where, you know, I'm not asking students to be like making the best eye contact with me for 50 minutes of, at a time, but even the coloring could get like mesmerizing um, and, and really distracting. But I try to bring the box of fun things to do to help people take care of their bodies while also interacting with the course materials. Um, and you've heard us mention several times 50 minutes. So, you know, that's the ideal client hour. So I do try to structure class around the 50 minute hour. So every 50 minutes taking a 10 minute break. And that's when, you know, people can walk around. Our, we have a very beautiful building, like walk around the building, maybe go outside. I use those 10 minutes, hopefully, to not talk to anyone because I've been talking a lot or just being on with fostering conversations or role plays or whatever. So taking care of the body in those 10 minutes. Um, another trick 
tip that I have in class sessions is just reading the room. So I'm a big pivoter. So I can tell by my students' faces and bodies what they're excited about and what they're not excited about. So if it's dry material on the spot, I'm going to be like, okay, let's take two minutes. Y'all get into pairs, pair up with someone that you haven't paired up with lately and talk about how you would explain this to a client. To me, that falls under embodiment. Or, okay, everyone, this is slow, or it's nine o'clock, we have about 20 minutes, everyone stand up and stretch. And even that is a way to invite the body into the classroom. Um, do those are some of your school aids? Yeah. I do uh, like to do my little check-ins at the beginning of class. I have a colleague who really enjoys having students come in and do a writing activity to start the class as a way to transition from outside world to the classroom. So I want to take another minute and check in with y'all um, and see if there are questions, responses, reactions at this point. Anyone? Please feel free to try, type them in the chat if you don't feel like talking. Yes. I wrote a response in the chat. Um, I, I'll turn my camera on. I hate being off camera, but like I'm, I'm doodling. So yeah. like <laughs> I, I'm actually winding yarn while I sit here because it's so I wrote, I love to doodle or color while listening to lectures. I have ADHD and need something to do with my hands or I'll pick up my fingers. Um, so like right now during this webinar, I am in fact uh, just winding yarn for my yes. cross stitch. My cross yes. stitch is far away, but the yarn is sitting here so I can just wind it and like absorb what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, so I completely yes. agree with you. But also as a person who I went back to for my bachelor's and was in my bachelor's during the pandemic, yes. it was very difficult because both of my children were home and I had to take care of them while my partner was at work while I was in lectures. My yes. autistic son, while I was in a meeting with my chair, decided to strip down and try and go outside. And I went, oh my gosh, I need to end this because my son is trying to streak. <laughs> and luckily, I was in a I was in a therapeutic setting and like getting my bachelor's in a therapeutic thing so she understood but I agree with you I agree that there is a fine line between the technology being supportive mm -hmm. versus the technology being distracting yeah yeah and I take my notes on a tablet so yeah, and which can be so great. And some therapists do that as well. I have a client who saw a different therapist while I was on maternity leave several years ago. And the client was very upset because the therapist was taking notes on a tablet, but then was getting text on the tablet and could tell that the therapist's attention was waxing and waning based on things happening on the tablet. So these things can be amazing, right? And we need to bring intention to how we're using them. And with your cross stitch, we have, there's someone in our program, does she, is it crochet or yeah. is she in crochets? And that is, I mean, she is just as present as Mary Ellen is, like fully present, might look down, but it, and if she was here, she would tell you it helps her stay more present to class session. Same thing. I crochet while I watch documentaries. I crochet <laughs> while I listen to audiobooks. Uh -huh. um, it keeps my hands busy because it's act. I'm getting that dopamine feed that I need uh -huh. to listen to things that I'm actually interested in instead of my mind going elsewhere. Yes. So, um, we do have about four to five minutes left. So if you Thank guys want to wrap it up. Yeah. Um, Thank you. However you'd like to wrap it up if you want to end with questions or however you want to wrap up. 
Yeah, so I'm going to lead us through a little closing practice. And if we have time at the end after this, if anyone else has questions, we can definitely open it up for that. Um, but I'm going to ask if um, it feels safe to you to close your eyes and just begin to check in with your body again and just notice how it might be feeling compared to when we started. So is there any tightness anywhere? Um, what's your breath like? Is it shallow? Can you breathe some depth into it? And as you just try to expand your breath a little bit deeper, you're sending some more oxygen to your brain. And as you do that, see if you can think of anything that you've heard um, or even seen in this presentation that you wanna take away with you. And then I ask that you just breathe into those one or just two things. And see how you can maybe implement those into the classroom or into your counseling session. And then just take a few more breaths. Again, noticing your body, how it's different even starting this closing exercise. Can you find a little bit more relaxation through your shoulders, through your torso or your stomach? And then when you feel ready, you can open your eyes. And we just wanna thank you for being a part of our presentation and hope that you did find a few takeaways from, from embodiment. Yeah. Thank you so much. If anyone has any questions, we have a couple of minutes left. I want to thank you guys. Oof, I hate talking without my camera on. I want to thank you guys because you guys were wonderful and I appreciated this topic because I believe it is a wonderful topic and is meaningful for everybody. So. Um, we both really love the book by Hillary McBride, The Wisdom of Your Body. Um, yes. I'm it has a spiritual component to it so if that's not your thing you may not love it but just a lot of she talks about some intersectionality and it's just a wonderful resource that's awesome because i've listened to the body keeps score and mm -hmm. i've had to stop at times because i'm doing that kind of work like, yes a work. lot so i had to stop a couple of times because it was like oh that hits home yeah but I appreciate that recommendation. Yeah. All right, well, we are going to wrap it up. So if anyone else has uh, anything uh, other than that, thank you guys for your wonderful presentation. Um, and I appreciate the time that you have put into this presentation. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.